The script that's written in our genes directs us from behind the scenes. The words within it shape life's destiny. Hidden in your DNA is your genetic dossier. It tells your future and your history. How traits can pass from parents to a child is something that has kept us so beguiled. Cracking the code. Genetic mysteries to unfold. Cracking the code. Genetic secrets will be told. Cracking the code. Genetic mysteries to unfold. Cracking the code. Genetic secrets will be told. Cracking the code. After an exciting race that ended in 2001, two different versions of the human genome sequence were published. Although they both had small gaps to fill, between them they included almost all of the three billion letters written within our book of life. Reading out this instruction book is a wonderful milestone, but as you then start turning the pages, you realize, I don't have a clue what this means. A lot of people viewed getting the genome sequence as the end of a process. Uh, I argued all along it was the beginning of a process. Uh, that it was a race to the starting line. The first task in understanding our book of life is locating and cataloging all the genes buried within it. Not only is a gene a small island in a much larger sea of DNA, it is broken up itself into even smaller bits called exons, which are separated from each other by larger bits of apparently inactive DNA called introns. Introns were discovered only after the invention of DNA sequencing in the late 1970s. They came as a complete surprise to scientists at the time and overturned their concept of a gene. So that a gene is spread out over a relatively large part of the chromosome. It was a very dramatic uh, change in our thinking. So it is a challenge to find the genes and parts of genes in you know, essentially a sea of 98% other bases that in some way are noise. The easiest way to locate genes within these billions of letters is to look for the particular three-letter codons that signal to the enzyme that transcribes the gene into messenger RNA where to begin and where to stop. Well, the start of a gene in the human genome always starts with an ATG sequence. And then you have a long stretch until you get to the end of the gene, which has a very definitive stop sequence. There's different combinations, but one can actually scan the sequence to identify these features. In between, there are specific nucleotides that tell the, the enzymes that uh, copy the DNA sequence when to splice the DNA. So just by using computer scanning programs, one can identify very accurately where the start, stop, and what the constituents are in between of a particular gene. And that's useful, but it, it probably will only identify maybe three quarters uh, of, of all the genes. So other methods are used to find the genes buried within our book of life. One of them came out of a surprising discovery about how this genetic information is transformed into biological action. As formulated by Francis Crick in the 1950s, the central dogma of genetics held that genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein and never in the opposite direction. Then, in the early 1970s, it was discovered that certain viruses contain an enzyme called RNA transcriptase, which can reverse this flow so that RNA is transcribed into DNA in violation of the central dogma. Using this enzyme, geneticists were now able to transcribe any messenger RNA sequence into its complementary DNA sequence which could then be read out like any other piece of DNA. The base pairing rules dictate that this new DNA sequence matches up exactly with a DNA sequence from within the gene that produced the messenger RNA in the first place. A computer scan of the entire genome can easily locate this unique bit of DNA. Once found, it tags this location as the site of yet another gene. 
This method of finding a gene by working backwards from its RNA product was pioneered by Craig Venter, who later went on to head the privately sponsored Human Genome Project. He called it the Expressed Sequence Tag, or EST, method, and it is now an essential tool for gene hunters. It's actually still the number one gene discovery tool in the world. It also created uh, the whole genome industry. But the EST method can only find a gene if it is actively expressing its messenger RNA. The muscle gene, for example, you have lots of muscle, so it makes many copies. So you get lots and lots of, 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 of copies of that. Whereas a gene which is used once, maybe, in the womb, to make a particular bit of the brain is extremely hard to find because its copy will only be there transiently and in very small amount. So it varies tremendously from tissue to tissue. You can't just take all the ESTs and count up and say that's how many human genes there are. So geneticists rely on yet another method to identify human genes. It compares our genome to those of other species with whom we have shared parts of our evolutionary pathway. I take mouse and human for an example you may not think they're very close but they're both mammals that means they both have the same body plan and they convert they diverge some tens of millions of years ago and since that time they've, they've gone on their separate way except for those key bits of the genomes that are essential for making a mammal and those bits will stay the same and so now if we bring back the two genomes and line them up we can see the bits that are the same and the bits that are different and so this is like a spotlight which illuminates the key bits of the genome obviously a yeast cell doesn't look very much like a human nor does a worm nor does a fruit fly but if we look at their genes we find we're amazingly closely related a lot of the genes that are needed to make a cell grow and divide were worked out one and a half billion years ago and are common to every organism on this planet the genes that are involved in replicating DNA, the DNA polymerases, for example, they are almost identical in sequence between bacteria and human. And the reason for this is the sequence is so essential to the life and the composition of that organism that it had to be maintained through evolution. And it worked for bacteria. There is no reason for nature to change it. It should work for human. And that's really why it's been maintained. All the various methods of finding the genes in our genome rely on computers. Many biological experiments are now done using a different kind of mouse. Well, there, there are now biologists who never touch a living thing. Uh, they touch keyboards and they process information. They, of course, work with other biologists who are, who, are, who are working on living organisms and experiments. But you can make remarkable progress by studying the data. If you ask me, the field of biology that is most in need of new creativity and energy and uh, good people is the computational side. And we need well-trained people who understand biology really well, but also understand computer science really well. Geneticists at their computers are now able to analyze and compare entire genomes, a fast-moving new field of discovery called genomics. It's just the most extraordinary trove of information. It's as if we've been living all our lives in a vast library, and we didn't realize there were books around us and we couldn't read. And suddenly, someone turned on the lights, and we can see books upon books on the shelves. And we've just worked out how to read. And we're going to be up every night for, for centuries reading these books in the library. We have now located and cataloged almost all of our genes. But that is just the first step in understanding our book of life. The next is to figure out what those genes are all doing. The function of the genes is to produce proteins, and so proteins are the focus of the next great effort at understanding our book of life. Genes code for proteins using the uniform four-letter language of the nucleotides, strung out in a one-dimensional sequence. This information is then translated into the non-uniform 20-letter language of the amino acids, which leads to a three-dimensional sequence. What's interesting about this 20-letter language is it has many different sizes and charges and shapes. And this enormous diversity has the property that the order of these 20 different letters in the protein language dictate how that string folds in three dimensions.